In the year 1066, William, the Duke of Normandy, would lead a force of 8,000 men across the English Channel to seize the throne of England. While outnumbered and subjected to a brutal battle even by medieval standards, he would slay his opponent, the English King Harold Godwinson, and take control of one of the wealthiest countries in the known world. The effects of the Norman invasion of England are profound. The entire English ruling class were displaced and replaced by French-speaking foreigners who were hungry for wealth and plunder. William as king would fulfill his promise to his supporters by granting them huge tracts of land and titles. Many of the Normans would intermarry with the English nobility and forge mighty dynasties. French would become the language of government and the ruling class. The English would lose control of the Catholic Church and their language would be regulated to the lower class, seen as brutal and unsophisticated. Serfdom was introduced to the island as millions were locked into feudal servitude for generations. The spirit of the English would endure, but their customs and language would transform under Norman influence. The days of the Anglo-Saxon culture were gone and would never be the same. How did such a calamity happen to one of the most powerful and wealthiest people in Europe? The answer is complex, but it can be said that the English were a people accustomed to being conquered. In 1066, the land known as England was ruled by the last Anglo-Saxon king, Edward the Confessor. His rule had been somewhat peaceful and many considered to be a golden age, the last flowering of the Anglo-Saxon culture. Edward was not a bold or intelligent man, but he had grown up in Normandy and was an acceptable ruler to many powerful allies. Edward assumed the throne under the restoration of the House of Wessex in 1042. He was the latest king in a long line stretching back to Alfred the Great, who had defeated the Vikings in 879. Alfred's descendants would each add or protect lands taken from the northeastern area of the island, known as the Danelaw, until the reign of Ethelred the Unready in 979. Ethelred would be blighted by renewed Viking attacks upon his succession to the throne. After an alliance with Richard, the Duke of Normandy, and defeat by a Norse fleet under the King of Norway, Ethelred agreed to pay the invaders off. Payments to the Vikings was not a new concept, but the asking price from the kings of both Norway and Denmark was staggering. The king would raise £250,000 over the next 27 years. This sum, known as the Danegeld, was only possible due to wide participation in taxation and the efficiency of the English administration. The payments were sufficient for a time, but only served to tempt the Vikings. The Scandinavian kings believed that the immense wealth generated in the Danegeld should be theirs by right of conquest. A plan was constructed to invade England and take its wealth permanently. In 1006, Swine Forkbeard, the king of Denmark, launched a series of raids that shook England to its core. Ethelred and his family fled to their allies in Normandy while Swine captured London in 1013. Both Ethelred and Swine would die soon after and leave the fate of the country to their sons, Canute and Edmund Ironside. Edmund was murdered in 1016, which left Canute to inherit the three kingdoms of England, Denmark, and Norway, which were combined into the North Sea Empire. The people of England accepted this outcome as inevitable, and Canute would keep most of the Anglo-Saxon traditions. He would install a system of laws devised by the Witten, an early form of parliament. Canute would agree to rule by the customs of the English people and promise to be a fair and just lord. There was a sense of hope among the commons that Canute would bring an end to the era of Viking attacks due to his dual possession of both Norway and Denmark. Canute would split the kingdom into four separate earldoms in an effort to simplify governance. The earls would be the king's most powerful and influential landowners and were located in Northumbria, Mercia, Wessex, and East Anglia. The Godwins of Wessex would become Canute's main English collaborators and eventually rise to become the most powerful family in the land. Canute had a fairly successful reign and would be one of the only two English monarchs known as the Great. Canute died in 1035, which began a struggle between his sons, Harold Harefoot and Hartha Canute. Ethelred's sons in Normandy, Alfred and Edward, would also contend for the throne. Earl Godwin simplified the issue of succession by handing Alfred over to Harold when he landed in Kent in 1037. Harold would castrate and blind the Atheling, an act that would kill him. The other earls of the kingdom condoned this act as barbaric, but eventually accepted it to avoid civil war. Both Harold and Hartha Canute would die in 1042, which left Edward as the only surviving heir. Edward was far from ideal as king, but possessed some qualities that made him an attractive choice over Canute's unloved sons. He was a middle-aged man who had spent most of his life in Normandy and possessed strong ties with the Norman nobility. This was an important bulwark against aggression from Scandinavia and considered to be an essential alliance. He was not a great warrior, but he was unusually pious, which earned him the nickname the Confessor. Edward struggled to reconcile the relationship between the Normans and English during his reign. He blatantly showed favoritism to the Normans and granted large tracts of land to various nobles and dignitaries. 
In 1051, a clash occurred in Dover between Norman knights and local townspeople. When Edward ordered Godwin to punish the town, he refused, leading to a conflict between the king and his most powerful landowner. The Godwins were briefly forced into exile after recruited thanes on both sides refused to fight a civil war over the issue. The Godwins would raise a fleet and return the next year in triumph, which forced the king to exile his Norman supporters. Within two years, the senior Godwin died and his son, Harold Godwinson, inherited the earldom of Wessex. At the same time, his brothers took the remaining three earldoms, which made the Godwins the de facto rulers of the country on the king's behalf. As Edward aged, it was apparent that he would not produce an heir with his wife, the daughter of the elder Godwin. The age-old problem of succession that had plagued the Anglo-Saxon royalty raised its head again. Edward had reportedly offered the throne to William, the Duke of Normandy, years before. William was the kingdom's most important ally, and it made logical sense for him to succeed the king. Other contenders for the throne were the heirs of Edmund Ironside and the Godwins themselves, who were already ruling the country in all but name. There was also evidence that the kings of Denmark and Norway had been offered the crown. The question of succession was a powder keg, which threatened to drag the country into civil war. The relationship between Harold Godwinson and William was complicated. Harold had visited Normandy in 1064 for unknown reasons and found himself a hostage of the Count of Ponfu. He was later rescued by the Normans and was coerced into swearing allegiance to William. He returned to England on semi-good terms with William, which would later become strained with Edward's decline. As Edward lay dying in 1065, he considered all the options available. He finally decided, or was pressured by the Witten, to choose Harold Godwinson as his heir. He died in early 1066, and Godwinson was crowned the very next day. Godwinson was fairly popular among the people and had no trouble in the election by the Witten. Several factors contributed to the haste of this decision, including the power of the Godwin clan, attacks from the Welsh and Scottish, and threat of an imminent invasion from the Norse. The country required a strong leader for protection against its many enemies, and this was the most logical choice. William was infuriated at this decision and began plans for an invasion after receiving approval from the Pope. He claimed that the throne had been promised to him by Edward and accused Godwinson of breaking his oath. At the same time, the King of Norway, Harald Hadrada, decided to seize the moment and planned to invade and attempt to restore the North Sea Empire. William was able to amass around 8,000 warriors. His army was mainly comprised of Normans along with aristocratic knights left over from the remnants of Charlemagne's Frankish Empire. The soldiers in William's army differed from the typical war bands ravaging Europe at the time. They were better trained and affluent enough to afford the purchase of horses, armor, and weapons. The warriors joined William's forces in hopes of receiving land, titles, and wealthy English brides. William also received support from wealthy non-combatants, such as nobles and members of the church. These men would contribute the funds to feed his army and construct ships to ferry him across the English Channel. The backbone of William's forces was the Mounted Knight, an oddity in England. The Normans had learned the art of horseback fighting from their Frankish hosts, which was a common battle strategy on the continent. The knights would ride a specially bred war horse into battle and attack infantry from above with sword or lance. He could also attack other mounted knights through the use of jousting, which took considerable time and skill to master. Of the 8,000 warriors William had amassed, two to 3,000 were armored knights on horseback. The English were not strangers to horses and were especially fond of using the animals to transport armored men outside of battle. There is evidence that the Vikings had used horses in this way, which led an English king to ban their export and fear that they would be taken by an enemy army. Despite these uses, the English still preferred to fight on foot in the shield for it and did not deploy mounted warriors in battle. William established invasion bases in the summer of 1066 at dives sur mer and St. Valery sur Sob in Normandy, now northwestern France. Tradesmen and woodcutters used the money collected from the church and Norman landowners to construct the required ships. While this was underway, another logistical problem arose, how to maintain the army and feed the horses. The several thousand horses required enormous amounts of barley, oats, and water, along with servants to clean the stables. William was able to organize all of this while keeping his army in a state of readiness as he waited for the winds in the English Channel to turn favorable. In the meantime, Godwinson, now King of England, had ordered the English fleet to remain anchored at the Isle of Wight for an impending Norman attack. The wind was not on William's side and forced him to delay his departure well into August. The English fleet eventually spent all of its supplies and returned home in the first week of September. William remained in Normandy while Godwinson turned his attention to a new threat in the north. Harold Hadrada, the King of Norway, had sailed an army down the Humber and was camped at Stamford Bridge near York. 
Godwinson rushed his army north at 20 miles a day to surprise him on the 25th of September in one of the most one-sided and definitive battles in medieval history. Hadrada's army was completely taken by surprise, many without even equipping their armor, and Hadrada himself was killed. This battle would be the last incursion of Vikings into England, and many historians declare it as the end of the Viking Age. Godwinson had little time to celebrate as the winds in the English Channel had finally turned favorable and allowed William to sail with his army on the 27th of September. William would land unopposed at Pevensey in southern England the next day. When news of William's landing reached Godwinson, he rushed back with as many soldiers that could keep pace. This flight exhausted his troops who had just fought a battle in the north and now had to contend with William's army in the south. The two groups would finally meet near Hastings on October 14, 1066, for a battle that would change the fate of England. The English army technically outnumbered the Normans and was well trained. It consisted of Huskarls, or household warriors, which were professional fighting men employed by the king and his brothers. He was also joined by thanes, providing mandatory military service and their retinue. The men were probably exhausted, and most of them had been present at the battle at Stamford Bridge. The professional army was probably also joined by Shire Fyrds, peasant armies in the south who were not accustomed to fighting. These men would have joined Godwinson as he moved south past London. The English army planned to deploy foot infantry in the form of the shield fort, an impenetrable wall of swords and axes that would repel any attacking forces. William placed his faith in mounted cavalry and archers, two strategies that would ultimately decide the battle in his favor. Godwinson occupied a ridge close to William's camp. He planned to form the shield fort and force the Normans to attack the higher ground. Some of the thanes abandoned their shields for large double-handed axes. William placed his army into three divisions, with most of the armored knights waiting in the third to exploit any visible enemy weaknesses. Both armies were evenly matched as the professional English warriors were as heavily armored as the Norman knights. The English armor used knee-length metal trousers, which favored unmounted fighting, while the Norman armor was split below the waist to make riding more comfortable. On the first attack, William sent mixed units of infantry, mounted knights, and archers at the shield for it. The English were successful in repelling the attack, and doubt began to creep into the Norman mines. The shield fort appeared to be impenetrable as the Normans suffered heavy casualties from the devastating axes and swords. At one point, William's horse was killed by a thrown spear, which forced him to engage on foot. Panic quickly spread among the ranks as his men believed William had been slain. William pulled back his helmet and rallied them by yelling, If you run, you will all die. The English became overconfident in their victory, which allowed William to order two feigned retreats using his mounted cavalry. The English shield fort began to fracture as men attempted to chase after the escaping army. They were quickly overcome by William's knights and archers as the English army began to fight a series of desperate last stands. The knights were able to isolate small pockets of warriors and kill them as they tried to defend themselves against more mobile opponents. Harold Godwinson was killed in one of these skirmishes. It is said that he took an arrow to the forehead and was then disabled by a sword cut to the thigh. Other sources show him being ridden down by mounted knights and dismembered by a series of cuts. Regardless of the manner, he was slain along with his brothers and many important members of the English nobility. The English establishment was quick to accept William as king and he was crowned in 1066 on Christmas Day. It was a simple decision for the country to make based on the past political turmoil and the security that William offered. William would declare that all the land of England was his by right of conquest and began dividing the spoils among his followers. William was not universally popular among the people who accepted him like they accepted Canute years before. He possessed a small group of hardened supporters who would bond to him through the granting of titles and land. This was a change from the English tradition of royalty, with William becoming the center which all wealth flowed. The new Norman elite of the country would quickly introduce the concept of wooden and stone castles to protect their new assets. Norman immigrants would arrive by the thousands to build favor with William and settle on the new land. The Norman conquest of England was one of the most significant wealth transfers in English history. The English hierarchy was completely destroyed with many of the landowning and warrior class slain, put in prison, or forced out of the country. Many of the nobles fled to Scandinavia and Scotland, some even went as far as Byzantium in the east. Many English widows and heiresses were forced to marry William's followers, while others volunteered to become nuns to protect themselves. Norman French became the language of government and the elite, while English was considered to be unsophisticated and regulated to the peasant class. Some of the ruling class did not accept this encroachment on English lands and organized a scattered resistance to the Normans. Earls in the north of the country would ally with the Welsh and Danes to capture York in 1069. The rebels would slaughter the Norman garrison and then attack Peterborough the following year. 
William retaliated by employing a scorched earth policy in the north and would systematically crush resistance over the coming years. Over the next 15 years of his reign, William would spend little time in England. He gave up trying to learn English and commanded that all royal documents be written in French. He purged the English church of the English and replaced them with French speakers. He would die in 1087, leaving a much-changed country in his wake. Was England truly changed? The English nobility had been displaced, but the core sense of Englishness remained among the peasantry. The people continued to favor English saints and would soon raise Edward the Confessor to sainthood. William would make very few changes to the government, which was passed on to him by English clerics and civil servants. The system was fairly uniform and relevant to much of the country. It had worked well in the past and continued to feature shires, local governments through the use of sheriffs and courts, and meetings of nobles to discuss grievances. Much of this was directly descended from Anglo-Saxon institutions, such as the shire moots and gatherings of the Witten. Participation was high among the population who favored their old traditions under new names. England would change under Norman rule, but it would remain English, a system that would shape the country to come.